Kalisperasas, good evening. Um, welcome all to the third seminar in the Greek community of Melbourne's History and Culture Public Seminar Series. The event tonight will have a different but not unusual format. Uh, it will be a panel discussion. Furthermore, it's our second event in the series honouring International Women's Day, and it's also held in conjunction with the Food for Thought Network. Before I pass you on to Dina Yerolimo, to introduce tonight's participants as the MC, uh, allow me to remind you of some housekeeping items and outline what's in store and what's been planned by the Greek community of Melbourne over the course of the next few weeks. Firstly, let's start with the seminars. Over the next four weeks, the seminars will be all online. There won't be any hybrid seminars at the Greek Centre as it'll be used for the comedy festival. All these seminars will be delivered by a series of Blockbus International speakers, all world acclaimed academics that have excelled in their field of research. Next week, we have Professor Alexander Kitrov, who will be speaking on how the Greek Revolution impacted the young nation of, of the United States at the time. Uh, on the 1st of April, we have Professor Pascalis Kitromelidis, who will be looking at aspects of the Greek political thought as uh, intellectuals try to articulate visions. visions visions of freedom brought about by the revolution. And on the 8th of April, we have the enigmatic Professor Paul Cartledge discussing Thebes, the forgotten city of ancient Greece. So please stay tuned to our upcoming notifications. Uh, furthermore, let me remind you that this weekend we have the Greek Music Festival, which to extent is a cut down version of our street festival. Um, there will be numerous bands performing, but please, but please book online, space is limited and entry is free. I think I've said enough. Enjoy the evening. Over to you, Dina. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel discussion. This event is in lieu of International Women's Day 2020. It was on last year's seminar program but the pandemic got in the way and uh, it was postponed. I'd like to thank um, those who responded to the call to participate, the, panel, the panelists uh, participate in this discussion and for waiting uh, one whole year to discuss some very important issues that touch many generations of Greek Australians. Special thanks to the Food for Thought Network who has included tonight's seminar in their calendar of events. Also many thanks to the Greek community and especially to Nick Dallas, the coordinator of the seminars for including this panel discussion to this year's program, despite the fact that it does not follow the theme of the 200th anniversary of the 1821 revolution. Our panelists tonight are Anthea Chaousis, a third generation Greek Australian, if I'm not mistaken, with a keen interest for community and philanthropic work, is a member of AHEPA and well-known aficionado of gastronomy and a food blogger. She turned her love for food into a career by becoming the food buyer for BP. Our uh, panel tonight, on the panel tonight, is also Victoria Kiliakopoulos, a journalist who has written for some of the largest publications in Australia former manager of the Hellenic Initiative Australia. She is currently communications manager at the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. Esther Natulidis is among the panelists. Esther is one of the most well-known arts advocates and activists in Australia. She has been in leadership positions in the arts sector for over two decades and recognized as one of the most influential people in arts and culture. Barbara Ioannou is the founder and president of the Food for Thought Network. She has a long and distinguished career in the education and training sector. Currently, she is a sessional lecturer at Swinburne University. I welcome you all and thank you for waiting again one whole year for this discussion. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor of History Joy Damusi, who will be the facilitator of tonight's discussion. Mr. Musi is the former head of the Melbourne University's history department. 
She has won numerous awards for her research into Australian history and has written several books and co-authored many more. Her work has been published in major historical journals and other publications in Australia and overseas and has received international recognition for her work and her research, often groundbreaking research. Last year, she was on a fellowship at Sorbonne University in Paris when the pandemic forced her to cut this fellowship short and return earlier to Australia, interrupting her work at the Sorbonne. One of Professor Damusi's research interests is uh, women's issues. We're very lucky to have her with us tonight. Thank you, Joy, and over to you. Thank you, Dina, um, and thank you very much for those um, wonderful words introducing our panellists tonight. Um, as you rightly said, Dina, uh, it has been a remarkable and tumultuous year since we last reflected on this uh, topic, uh, e exactly a year ago, actually, and I think it was exactly a year ago that I fled Paris to, to come home um, as the pandemic hit. But I guess it's an interesting question because the other big change um, that we've seen is a very dramatic one in the last few weeks about gender and women and attitudes to generations and different generational responses to issues around um, culture and um, women's experiences. So it is a remarkable week to be actually talking about these issues. And um, I think we would have had a very different discussion had it been a year ago, to be honest. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here and a delight to be um, facilitating this discussion. Um, so what I'd like to do is begin by reflecting on the sort of the, the values and cultural expectations um, that Greek women carry, if I can put that expression there, and, and really raise the question, you know, is there a, a clash of values and assumptions and beliefs between um, the generations? Um, we're all women, um, does that bind us or are these generational issues so pronounced now that we've, um, the diaspora has flourished in Australia now for several um, generations? So has this emerged? Do we see a shifting, uh, a shift in the, these expectations among different generations? So I think with that very broad question, I'll, I'll uh, throw it over to Anthea um, and um, from her perspective, coming from where you're from, Anthea, there as a, as a third generation um, Greek Australian woman to kick start the discussion. So over to you, Anthea, what would be your response to that question about intergenerational tension? Thank you, Joy. Um, I definitely don't think there's a clash amongst all values and belief systems, um, but I do think in certain areas of life, uh, absolutely, at least between third generation and potentially first generation Greeks or our grandparents that have uh, migrated here. I definitely think the key contentious area is probably the relationship space or female relationships to work now, that whole work-life balance element, pursuing a career. Um, not, that, uh, not to say that our um, grandparents or grandmothers did not work, um, but it's, it's very different in terms of us striving to find value in the day-to-day -day work that we do do as opposed to just uh, making um, ends meet and putting food on the table for your children. Again, it's such a nurturing element in that generation. It's all for others. It's that always putting others ahead of yourself. Um, whereas I do think uh, my generation in particular is probably a little bit more selfish in that We'll do things for ourselves as well and nurture ourselves a little bit prior to giving our energy to others. And that kind of transcends into the relationship space as well. So where, mm. um, I mean, I have regular debates with my Yiga around uh, not wanting to rush into anything um, and her being like, look, you can't be alone your whole life. Um, so just very different philosophies and approaches to that too, where it's finding the right person as opposed to not being alone. Um, and I do think uh, beyond, beyond the relationship space as well, I, I do find um, within my generation there's probably, uh, you know, a split level of um, uh, in terms of how, how we approach religion. That's probably another, another point of deviation too. Um, 
But increasingly, uh, I would say that older generations are respectful of our choices or um, becoming enlightened, not enlightened, so to speak, but just um, just acknowledge that there is a difference amongst us and the way we go about our day to day. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful way to start. Those comments are fantastic. Um, uh, so, Anthony, I mean, I guess relationships and religion are always at the core of cultural difference or tension. Um, and, of course, in Australia and the world, relationships and religion have come, have transformed, right, you know, in the last 50, 60 years. Um, and I guess the question is to what extent do the generations shift with that and to what extent is there acceptance in changes? I, I wonder, and this is something we can come back to, whether it's more pronounced as a diaspora, you know, in mm -hmm. Greece, do the AAs have this problem? Maybe not. Um, yeah. You know, my relatives in Greece are probably a little bit more open. Um, yes. Whereas the diaspora, there's a kind of a sense of hanging on to, you know, what was. Um, and the dynamism of change can be very confronting around those things. Completely agree. I often reflect on that and go, wow, they're more progressive in Greece uh, mm -hmm. in this respect. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've noticed that within my own family as well. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's that tendency of, you know, they left their, they left their youth at such an age and that's all they've known. Um, and uh, it kind of was like this sticking point of we must retain everything that was to that culture bar the financial element will progress on uh, Australia's terms with that um, and yeah it, it is it is mm. different I think mm. the other point as well um, uh, at least within the Australian diaspora community is um, probably the expectation back to your one of the points being expectations mm. values beliefs the expectations mm. um, females hold of men these days mm. I do think we um look for that balance as opposed to just a provider. Um, so someone that will in future uh, be there to support. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that's actually a key difference in, mm. in what we're looking for. Okay. Thank you, Anthea. That's a fantastic, um, you know, point and way to start our discussion. So I think I'll turn now to Vicky. So Vicky, just picking up on this point about the two worlds, I guess, you know, um, and the tensions that have emerged in the diaspora and, and comparing them to Greece. And I think, Vicky, you've been both, you know, you've worked in Greece and in Australia, um, you've had positions in both, both contexts, um, seen the way they've played out, you know, in the, in the regard to these issues. I mean, what would your take be? I mean, how do you see the, 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 the intergenerational question? Well, it's an interesting one because I sort of grew up in the, the 70s, the 80s in the, the time capsule that was the Greek village of, you know, Fitzroy. Um, <laughs> and it was very much um, very different to what I assume, you know, people are experiencing now. Uh, and so there was huge, you know, culture clash, especially sort of in your teenage years it became, you know, a source of much existential angst. Um, those sort of expectations and know led to very much a, a, a double life for a lot of people back then you know you you lived the palatable life that your parents kind of knew about um and then you kind of had this other external world that you you lived in and you were professional in and you know as you get older it didn't change for a while you know mm -hmm. you still had to sort of censor who you were to some degree because they just couldn't cope with it you know mm -hmm. um and and that was always a bit of a source of um you know, angst for me growing up uh and you know, I don't know. I've got an 84-year-old father now. So, um, you know, the, the tyrant of my youth is now a, a very, um, you know, needy and uh, old man who I look after uh, and a 10-year-old son. So, again, I kind of have this intergenerational thing happening now in terms mm. of culture and how you express that. Um, mm. Very much in Greece finding that, I, you know, when I first got there, I felt like I'd been you know, duped because everybody was living with people and they'd had, you know, the, the, the social mores were very, very different there. Um, although there was still a divide there between people living in Athens and the village. Mm. So very much so they were having some of the same issues as we were. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that those expectations, again, about um, education and not quite knowing what that might mean, coming from a, a parents who were illiterate, essentially, or, you know, uneducated, uh, 
wanting you to really get that education, but they're not quite understanding where, what choices you might make, you know, as a result of that in terms of your career, mm. in terms of your life, um, and still thinking that, you know, um, you're going to end up being the, you know, the good Greek girl. Um, and eventually, I remember my father saying, you know, if you're not going to keep studying at one point, you know, you get married, you know, at 21. It's like, not really on the agenda at the moment. Um, or a classic story I was telling is my dad at one point when I was a journalist, I was very much doing work that he didn't understand going out, you know, to country trips and overnight trips and, you know, working night shifts, you know, covering police rounds and things. And um, he was just quite distraught about what this might mean for my reputation. And, uh, and he, um, I remember saying to him, he's saying to me once, why don't you just get a job at a bank? And I was like, why, you know, and thinking I've got this exciting life as a journalist um, because it was, um, it's a clean job and your husband will know where you are all day. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's an interesting perspective. Do you think yourself as a parent, you know, I mean, presumably you're, views have changed, you know, and do you think the next generation will be far removed from your father's? Do you think though there is a significant shift along that that, that path? I think so. I mean, that was very much, you know, mm. people, the, the, the migrants of the 60s, mm. although, you know, within that there were still people who did, didn't have that view. I think that was very much a village mm. uh, mentality um, mm. and uh, specific to that sort of, you know, what mm. are people going to say, you know, mm. scenario? Mm. Um, yep. But yeah. You know, you, you, you sort of reconcile things and you, you know, mm. you, even with my father, I think there's been a, a gradual ex acceptance among the dismay at my choices. Um, but, um, you know, with my, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I have a son because I think, you know, I would struggle with something sometimes, I think, yeah. if I had a daughter at this point. Mm. Um, but, um, but no, mm. yeah, I think, I think this generation, I'd like to think they have choices, they have, mm. um, uh, can be more authentic selves as well. Mm, thank you. That's that's great. Um, uh, I know people have written much about Fitzroy, but <laughs> Fitzroy looms large in many of our biographies, and um, um, that was very much a time when that small village mentality was very sort of pronounced, wasn't it, in, in Greek culture around those suburbs. Um, but both of you mentioned education, and um, education, I think we'll all agree, has been transformative for all of us um, in so many ways. So I wanted to throw to Varvara. Um, Varvara, you're an educator um, and in your organisation you've, you've worked with um, Greek women from across the generations. So can I just, um, over to you for your comments about this question about intergenerational conflict or tension. Well, um, there's definitely a conflict into the generations, and I agree with most of what Anthea and uh, Victoria already said. Uh, I need to preface the discussion, though, that every family and every situation is very different. What we're talking here tonight is generalised information, mm -hmm. so I think we need to, uh, to say that at the outset. The other thing that I want to say is that as a baby boomer, and just... Um, to clarify, baby boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. I'm a baby boomer, but also I belong to the sandwich, what is called the sandwich generation. Women of my generation have had it really hard in the 60s and, and early till mid 70s, I would say, because um, they lived in two different worlds. Uh, the parents, most of the parents, like 75% looking at the literature came from rural environments and they were not educated. Uh, they came from the village. So they came from what is called the collectivist society. And um, in the collectivist society, we've got values. Uh, they value the family, or the family and the government or uh, the group is responsible for everybody's well-being. They valued philotimo. You had to be an ikokira. You had to um, work hard, listen to your father and mother and all of that. The assumptions that they made where that they, would, they were the best, they knew best, and they tried to preserve what they brought here. They believed that in order to progress in society, you had to um, uh, go on with education, go on with education. You will uphold the family name. So looking good and Tithapio Cosmos, very much part of that mentality. You would marry a Greek boy 
okay? And you will have children, you will baptize them and so forth. They also um, expect it that because they've sacrificed and they've done all these things for the children and have taken them to another, the other part of the world, when the children grow up, uh, they will look after the parents. So that's why we've got all of this conflict at the moment between the different generations. On the other side, now we've got women that have got, and men that have gone through the school here in Australia and then in the workforce. Uh, Australia, if we look at the, the classification is classed as an ind individualistic society. And those that are more interested to look at this, they can look at Hofstede studies. So uh, what does the individualistic society uh, say? It's the I culture. I can do this. I'm responsible. If it's going to be, it's up to me. So conflict between the home and, and um, the work environment. I remember when I came to Australia in the 70s and I came when Whitlam got into power, um, there were so many theater groups uh, that uh, an identity, the split identity, you know, uh, that people had uh, living and working in, in Australia. I went to so many theater groups. There was a, um, a, a play called Itaftotita and was um, like put around every school and every um, organization that I knew. I don't know how many, uh, actually, parastasis had, that group had done. So there is definitely conflict, and the conflicts occur because the values that the parents have and the values from the prevailing culture that we live is very different. In in all of that as well, we had um, up till then we had the prevailing philosophy of uh, assimilation. It wasn't until, you know, Whitlam and then um, uh, Fraser that implemented multiculturalism and things started to change. When I was meeting people uh, that were born here and came to Australia, they didn't even want to identify and say that they were of Greek background. Uh, and that continued till 2000 uh, when I was going around and meeting uh, women uh, that were born here and talking to them about Greek community organizations and whether they were involved, their response was, oh, they're daggy, who wants to get involved with those? And I'd ask the question, they didn't even want to identify. That's why I called the network Food for Thought Network. The other thing um, that I found when in my first career as a teacher, uh, when we were trying to implement bilingual programs in an inner suburban uh, school, the worst opponents were people of Greek background or migrant women that were brought up here because of the indoctrination that had occurred through this assimilationist policy. Mm -hmm. So obviously mm -hmm. education has got a lot to do with it. And Vicky said before, yeah, people in Greece are more progressive. We have to be careful who we compare with. If we look at the educated women here in Victoria and the educated families with children and those in Greece or cities, I think Vicky made the differentiation between villages and, mm. and uh, cities, of mm. course. Um, mm. there, there's a huge difference. But if we could even compare children of mm. educated parents, there wouldn't be that, that many differences now mm -hmm. between the third generation, like mm. the XS age and my children to my sister's children in Greece, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, there's definitely conflict and my generation has had a really hard time. So, um, I, and I think we need to understand why. So mm. I hope that I've provided a bit of a context. Um, Thanks, Ravada. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that um, both you and Vicky have articulated the challenges in growing up and, or, you know, in being a Greek in Australia at that time. There's no question. There were so many, so many issues to pick up and so many uh, challenges to sort of fight, really, um, and, and, and to recast what it meant to be Greek in Australia, which is, was the work or has been the work of the second generation, to be honest, that recasting. And that recasting takes enormous amount of effort and energy and exhaustion, quite frankly. Um, so I think that's what we've seen here and you've articulated that very well, thank you. 
So Esther, over to you. Um, you've heard the comments of the others. I was um, just, I mean, from your point of view and your perspective in the arts as well, how have you perceived this, this, this question? I mean, what's your take on intergenerational tensions and issues? Um, how would you articulate them? Mm. Oh, look, it is super complex and a really interesting question. Again, it's thank you to Dina and to Varvara for bringing us together. Um, and, uh, and I'm uh, on the lands of the Bunwarang and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation today, but I was born on Gadigal land in Sydney and I'm you know, with my family twice migrants. So um, my parents migrated in 64. We all moved back to Greece mm. in um, uh, in 1980 and then mm. we moved back mm. and then my parents moved back in 2010. So they mm. lived there. Now, my sister lives in Canada and has been there for uh, over 20 years. And I've also lived in Germany as well as in, in Greece uh, and uh, Melbourne for 20 years now. Um, and so when I think about that as moments of movement and migration, uh, I think the thing that strikes me as being at the heart of the tensions um, is around class in all the different ways that we think of education, opportunity, social access, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I think um, a, a, a few of us have mentioned this already, but my relationship with my yayades when, when they were still with us and my parents were in their early 80s now, um, but my relationship with my yayades was actually um, a lot more honest and comfortable and direct about my life, my choices, my sexuality and so on. On than um, than it is with my parents and the mm. yeah, the, the, the stories um, that the others have just told in particular around that that loss of village life the lack of education and you know we must also acknowledge the trauma of migration which for an early adult was not exactly the the most um, you know, well thought through choice. I mean, my mother mm. often says, "Well, I I got on the boat because everyone else did." Mm. And while my parents uh, thought and articulate that they came to Australia for a better life, they never for a moment, um, I guess, came to grips with or even discussed with their peers that a better life would mean a different life. It wasn't the same mm. life, but better. And so they, they were to have children who had different accents, mm. who spoke a different language, mm. who brought home very how do you say, um, alienating and anxiety inducing ideas. And then there was the saving face and so on among their peers in terms of, you know, uh, not just the, the didabio cosmos, but the whole kind of, you know, axioprepi and, you know, th things that we've discussed and the trauma of their migration, there was no older generation for them to walk down the street and speak mm. to, mm. Um, you know, my grandparents on one side were illiterate, had no phone, you had to make an appointment, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so to walk three kilometres and get them to come to their place to speak on the phone. And even then, they didn't want to upset their parents, you know, with the difficulties of what they're experiencing. And so all of that led to, uh, you know, I've, I've, for example, I've worked with my father um, uh, in factories and workshops. Um, and there are ways in which, you know, we dealt a closeness through making. Um, but um, there are aspects in my relationship with my mother that are irreconcilable and insurmountable um, in a gulf that doesn't seem to be able to be crossed. And that's mm. not something that I experience um, with my yayades. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I never knew my grandparents for all sorts of reasons that many of you will understand. You know, they were there in Greece, my the parents came out. So, but I see my my mother and her relationship with her grandchildren. And it is a it is it is a interesting relationship, isn't it? That it's that one where actually this intergenerational tension might be somewhat softened ultimately as you get older. Um, maybe not. But um, I think coming back to Vavada's point, you know, in a way it is very individual depending on your circumstance and family, I think. But um, on the other hand, we can all sort of relate to the fact that 
things are very different for us and, you know, were for that first generation. Obviously, the reasons you've been saying is to that incredible trauma of migration, and let's not underestimate that. Um, I mean, quite extraordinary, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a really good kind of point about the, the role of grandparents in that, in that context. Um, but I'm just intrigued by your, the fact your parents went back there, Esther, so, and actually they settled back there, which is interesting. I mean, was it, again, for them a, a situation where that was much more comfortable or desirable, that the, the, the cultural shock of coming to Australia didn't quite suit them, think, so to speak? I think like a lot of migrants, they never truly imagined that it was going to be forever, even in the early years. Mm. Because, you know, we'll, mm. we'll go to Australia, this strange place, we'll make some money and we'll go back. But then obviously, mm. you know, the coup happened, the junta, the, you know, what, what kind of life did you want to go back to? They first wanted to migrate back in 69, uh, but then personal mm. circumstances intervened. Mm. And, yeah, in eighty went back. You know, they were they were shocked, as others have just been saying, that things had changed, that mm. life had gone on. You know, this mm. kind of, uh, ossified sense of values and and so on here. Mm. But then by by the time twenty ten rolled along, and you know they were getting on. Um, I live in Melbourne. My sister lives in uh, mm. Canada. For my father, it was, you know, I still feel fit and strong. I want to spend time with my siblings. Let's go back to Greece my last year you know, so we can live. Whereas for my, for my mother, who has a special talent for finding the pessimism in any situation, she would say, well, you know, we've both left us. Might as well go to Greece to spend our last years to die. <laughs> Very different approach that they yeah no thanks for that thank you for sharing that that's wonderful point about you know different perspectives I guess of another sort um but let's wind up on this question I'll just come back to Anthea if if you if we could Anthea so just to sort of ask you and I won't dwell on this so much but this question of how can we overcome these these sort of different perspectives generational shifts I mean is it about simply moving through life, right? You know, that life yeah. changes, that, that it's about educating our relative, you know, our, our grandparents, our parents in how life has moved on. Um, and, you know, in relation to women, things are changing all the time, of course. Uh, as I said earlier, the last few weeks have been quite extraordinary in terms of talking about women's experiences in ways that our grandparents could never have imagined, perhaps, um, talking about sexuality, talking about relationships, as we said. Mm. So, Anthea, do you want to just reflect a little bit on, from your perspective, what you would see as just briefly, and then we'll move on to the next few questions, you know, in terms of how, how you think these things can be resolved? It's, it's a really interesting one, and I think... Um... I think it's challenging as people get older, they actually tend to be more stuck in their ways and also uh, in their mindsets as well. And education takes time, but it also takes a willingness to learn or to, um, yeah, a, just a will mm. to accept that something might be different to what you've known. Mm. Uh, so I almost think it's it's really uh, a challenge to want to change, like, you know, a yaya or papu or even parents, um, uh, I think it's just sometimes an acceptance that uh, we'll never see eye to eye on certain things. Um, you've just got to learn to live or accept that, you know, this will nurture me or this will give me happiness and as we love each other. But absolutely, to Esther's point, there continues in every family to be irreconcilable differences, but life is also too short to mm. dwell on those differences sometimes mm. or, you know, make it, make it a... Um, a point uh, of um, or just a, a dwelling point of friction. So, you know, it's just almost, yep, we're never going to see eye to eye. Let's just uh, mm. be continue to love in the way that we can. Mm, great. Thank you. Before we finish on this point, did the, anyone else want to just quickly add a comment here? Because um, we'll, we'll go down to the next set of questions. I'm not hearing any I further. Any Sorry. Yep. Uh, Varvara, just quickly uh, before we go yeah, on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think somebody mentioned relationships before. I think it was Esther. Mm -hmm. It comes down to relationships you've got with your children or your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I think it is expected that the second and third generation will have different values. So it's not a, a what is called a uni directional 
uh, process, but um, what is called in the literature a bi-directional process. So the parents transmit their values to the children and the other way around. Children transmit their values to my, when, with my children, I've got a very open relationship and they tell me, mum, um, this is not helping me. These are our values. We respect yours, but you need to respect ours. So I think the relationship is a very important way of being able to live together and understand one another. Going back to the first generation, they did the best that they could with the tools that they had, the education that they have. So we need to show a little bit more compassion and understanding. Mm, I think so. Never goes astray, compassion, understanding. Thanks, Vavada. We'll move on then to looking at the role of women. Um, so, you know, historically women have been the custodians of tradition, the custodians of the, the memory that they're bringing in the migration process. And that is, there has been pressure, of course, on women to continue those traditions. Um, men, of course, practice them and continue them as well, but really... We will all agree that it's, you know, our yaya, our, our mothers who have kept that those traditions going. Um, do you think that's going to continue? Do you think that will change with the, in the diasporic context? Um, obviously, the first generation, we all know that generation of our mothers, my mother, um, it, you know, they, they, they felt that acutely. They felt the pressure of that quite profoundly. Um, to continue those traditions at every level to the point, I think, where it drives them probably to exhaustion, to be, yeah. to be honest. Um, I think that has changed with my generation. I don't feel quite the same pressure um, for all sorts of reasons and, and so on. So I guess it's a question about who ultimately will continue the traditions if women don't. And I guess that's, that's often the, the, the way this, has been, this question is framed. But are women feeling, well, it should be shared, it should, it's a, it's, it should be a, 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 I don't want to use the word burden, low can sometimes be burdensome. Um, is it something to be shared and, and um, spread around rather than, you know, women having that responsibility? So I think for this one, I'll start with Esther, actually, because um, I guess working in the arts, Esther, there's a lot of um, a discussion about, um, about culture and who owns culture and, and how cultures uh transmitted and understood uh, and articulation of culture. So perhaps Esther, I can ask you about that. What are your views? I think that's exactly right, Joy. I mean, um, you know, in, a, in the broader sense, culture is simply the practices um, that, um, you know, we do and enjoy and carry out, um, the customs and rituals by which we welcome people into our homes, exchange ideas, um, the ways in which artists and creative people and also um, uh, other practitioners um, and, and religious people draw on many, many thousands of years of tradition in order to make uh, and convey uh, what gives us that sense of identity and meaning and so on. Mm. So everyone, men and women, uh, people mm. of all genders are carrying on cultural practices. Mm. It very much tends to be women, though, who are drawn upon to interpret that, that those cultural mm. practices. And I'm in this funny kind of position, my fan, I sort of realised the last few years where, you know, I'm kind of an outsider on, on, on a lot of levels, you know, I'm not uh, Greek Orthodox, I'm not your kind of, you know, um, heteronormative, you know, classic career path kind of person. But I find that, um, for example, my cousins and their children will draw on me to explain um, the Easter customs and ritual or to translate the little year to them. Mm -hmm. um, because I've taken a very active interest mm -hmm. in Greek Orthodox culture, even though I don't believe in God. I had a very awkward conversation with one of my cousins about just under 20 years ago, um, hello if he's here, uh, who asked me and, and honoured me with the invitation to be the godmother of his um, firstborn son. And to his great surprise and disappointment, I said no. But I said no because to be a kubara mm. is the embodiment the instantiation of that child's relationship with the church mm. it's not mm. just the mm. christening or by the bufetes you know we'll have a nice time and and you know um and i think for parents who are raising their children in a greek orthodox way it would be 
important to have a Gubara who mm. um, had not only a sense of that knowledge, but absolutely uh, the values and the belief to be nurturing, you know, in, in, in that way. Mm. Um, and I've always wondered, we've not really discussed it over the years, and I, and I hope that he has understood, um, but it was simply not something that I could say yes to. Mm. Even though in many other contexts, I'm drawn upon for traditions and cultural mm. norms. Thanks, Esther. It's very complex, isn't it, the relationship that women do have to culture, as you've so beautifully articulated there with that example. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Vicky, I don't know um, how much you've written about this sort of thing. Um, I'm sure you've written extensively about this question, um, but what would you say around this, this idea of, I guess, cultural transmission, um, cultural memory, cultural custodianship? I mean, how do you see your role too, but, but generally on this one? Um, it, it's been a very um, interesting uh, journey for me on this front because, um, you know, women are very much, you know, the bearers of culture. Uh, and um, my mother died when I was 25. Uh, and until then, you just kind of assumed mm. that you, it was just going to be around, things happened around you, and, and you were sort of quite passive. Mm. Uh, and after that, I had to take a very um, uh, deliberate, you know, um, make a deliberate choice to be Greek mm. or to what in terms of what I was going to carry on mm. um, and being a mother mm. obviously um, uh, brought that on as well later on um, but I was quite confronted by that and I think that sort of set, set me off on a path of if I'm going to carry this on what am I carrying on I need to understand what I'm carrying on um, and I sort of immersed myself from that point very much in you know, Greek culture and understanding that, uh, spent a lot of time in Greece. Mm. Um, it became, you know, my subject matter professionally to some degree, mm. you know, yeah. more and more, yeah. Uh, yeah. writing about it, exploring yeah. it, um, you know, as a chronicler of the diaspora, as a travel writer and sort of, sort of discovering mm. Greece, you know, travelling through Greece trying to find the food, the, the mm. tastes of, of my childhood mm. you know? um, and then wanting mm. to cook and, you know, do mm. that for my family. Mm. Um, and you do, I mean, you know, when, when you're surrounded by it, as I said, even in Australia, those who come from, you know, as big extended families, mm. I think it sort of just happens around them and the cousins mm. of Easter and it's put on. Mm. If mm. I have to do Greek Easter, I have to do Greek mm. Easter mm. Um, and mm. I have to make the, the soup and I have to do everything and drag my son to, um, to church and uh, I take him to Greek school as much to his horror. Um, and, it, you know, you have to do it quite deliberately mm. as, as I said and mm. that comes naturally sometimes and some, some things don't um, and I've sort of reconciled that with myself and um, mm. uh, what I feel comfortable doing and unlike mm. Esther said you know the religious stuff I really like the rituals and the traditions mm. but I can't you know mm. although I did have this discussion with my son about you know uh, the Easter bunny just as being just as incongruous as dad so as, as God <laughs> sorry so you know you can believe what you want to believe um, <laughs> but um Yes, I think for yeah. me it's been very much a big part of my life and my sort of mm. journey trying to sort of mm. reconcile that culture and accepting what I can pass on and can't because, again, you know, you, you, you're not surrounded by it so I can only pass on. And you, you do need to have an authentic relationship with your child. You can't sort of put the professional Greek hat on constantly and, mm. and ramming it down someone's throat. It's going to become what's mm. naturally and mm. you hope that they love the things that you love about the culture. Mm. Um, you know, mm. I took my son to Greece a couple of times. You know, I'm trying. You know, you try to mm. expose them to what it is, but then they'll have to find their own thing. Exactly. Ultimately. Yeah. No, I, I, that's right. And I mean, your point resonates very much with me in terms of the big family. We don't have a big family here in Australia. It's very much us. You know, the the small nuclear family, as it were. And um, I have, um, you know, I owe a huge debt to my sisters who are much more conscientious on this front than I am about the, the culture. But, you know, I, I can be a bit more passive because they are incredibly active on this front. But uh, I know those big extended Greek families where culture happens and you walk into it and it sort of appears. Um, it's not, it's so much harder, I think, when, yeah, you've got kind of a lot more work to do um, if you don't have that infrastructure, if I could put it like that. Um, but but it is a really interesting question about, um, I guess, how much you can do as well, you know, and and what what parts of it 
it, it, you know, can, ex can naturally organically continue, but other parts have to sort of be worked out. Religion is a huge one, and I'm sure we'll come back to that towards the end. But um, yeah, that's the one I think we've many of us have wrestled with in terms of what components of religion are those components you'd like to pass on, and those perhaps you might be more critical of. Um, thanks, Vicky. Um, over to you, um, uh, Anthea. There we go. Um, I yeah, it's, it is very interesting, I guess. Uh, and as um, as Diana mentioned at the start, I'm a massive uh, lover of food. So um, from a very very young age, I took a keen interest in food, and uh, my memories were tied to um, zimosying uh, with my yaya. You know, um, we would pre every Easter do the kuluria together do the tsurekia together dye your eggs and I loved it that's how I they the happiest memory so I think I latched on to that throughout my childhood and also wanted to nurture in that very same manner um so I think from a sense uh women um preserve culture through food but also through the really that is also linked inextricably to all our cultural um, traditions because uh, we inherently celebrate all our religious landmarks with food. Um, but, e yeah, even beyond that, um, you know, you think of a nemosino, you make your goleva, like it's everything. Everything comes back to food. Um, so uh, I think um, for me it was very easy to kind of take on that role even within the family, within my generation, of retaining that cultural element. Um, the, uh, what I do worry about most um, is probably in the generations of the future, so, you know, hereafter, my kids and so forth, is probably language beyond anything else um, uh, because even within, you know, uh, my say my parents' generation, but even um, uh, I see some of their un uncles and aunties uh, that were probably a bit more um, attuned to adjusting than my year was, um, and learnt English and speak English to their grandchildren that are a little younger than I mm. and they don't go to Greek school. So I think language is probably what I'm most concerned about because that's not really uh, connected to either females or males. It's, another, again, another appreciation element. And I do feel, um, sadly, that potentially our Greek language system within Australia um, has kind of uh, decreased over time and... Mm. Um, ensuring that people are connected to our Greek culture through language has deteriorated. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, I am shocked, um, you know, within my generation, we still have, um, well, when I went to uni, Nuga still existed mm. and that kind of um, <laughs> spurred an element of, wow, there's like these Greek, uh, Greek events and then you become, you, you really begin to feel proud of your culture again. I think everyone goes through this period, at least in your teenage years, where you try to distance from it. It still occurred in my generation, undoubtedly, as Vicky mentioned, and um, Esther mentioned too, it occurred in your generation. Um, but uh, I think once you start travelling to Greece and then once you get into those more, tw your 20s, you really do realise, wow, we've got a great culture um, and as you become more educated, but not educated in the sense of book smart, just culturally mm. attuned, mm. um, you respect the fact that you've got a rich culture to draw back mm. to. Uh, mm. and, or, and, you know, other people, um, uh, just friends that aren't of those richer cultures, latch onto it as well or want to learn about mm. it more. And you go, wow, I should take pride in this. Mm. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's an evolving relationship with culture but um yeah I guess where I worry about it most is throughout it through our language mm. more than anything thanks for raising language it's so important isn't it and as a Greek school rebel I I have suffered the burden of that rebellion <laughs> um my Greek is appalling for those of you who've had the um you know pleasure I <laughs> use with that word of listening <laughs> to it um but yeah look I think you're right absolutely I mean I guess the quick question I was going to actually ask, ask you do you feel responsibility for carrying it on yeah yeah I do yeah. but I also okay. kind of um am happy to take yeah. that okay. 
responsibility, but I also yeah. acknowledge um, my brother uh, is okay. equally as um, mm -hmm. you know passionate, and mm -hmm. even from a language point of view, uh, it far excels mine. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, in different areas, we've both retained our love. Um, he's also very political, and I think that stems back mm. to our democratic Greek roots. Yes. Um, whereas I, I probably uh, foster the culture in again um, the gender stereotypes of that more nurturing manner. Mm. Um, so it's okay. interesting. It's kind of yep. played out uh, organically like that in my family, but every mm -hmm. family is different. So, mm. okay. um, yeah. Thank you. Varvara, over to you. Well, <laughs> I know you love this question. It's so interesting. This is a very good complex. question. So up you go. It's yeah. not really a straight answer. So um, who are the carriers for culture? It depends, again, on the families and the role models that the children have. In my family, for example, my kids share equally whatever happens in the home and they carry the traditions. Now, there's another aspect that we haven't talked about is the mixed marriages and um, how that plays out in terms of uh, which culture or both cultures carried on. And religion was mentioned. It's very interesting because we, we did a survey through the group just before um, Christmas. One of the questions we asked, one of the questions, there were many questions, you know, what it means growing up. Uh, what did you hear your parents telling you what you're going to tell your kids? Uh, there's different questions. But on the religion, we put three. Uh, how important will you, which more important for you to um, put on and ask uh, to your children transmit? Language, culture or religion? The number one, uh, Anthea, was language, which was really interesting. Um, then culture and then religion, which is very different to what's happening in America. So, of course, the sample, okay, we have is small and it's not, um, it couldn't be representative, okay, but I'm just saying some of that data. The other thing that, uh, and uh, when I looked at um, the data uh, that was coming through, what they're going to tell their children. We ask them what they heard from their parents and what they're going to tell their children. Uh, the number one was have philotimo, learn Greek, uh, study hard was the, the other one, and care for elders. They were the, the four top um, uh, areas that um, that they answered. Mm. Now, in terms of the carriers, even in the first generation, not all families are the same. Mm. I was, um, it was funny, I was at the rally on Monday mm -hmm. and I get a photo, a photo from my husband who'd made a lagana and he set up a table with all the Nistissima, uh, Elias, Tarama, and I sort of said to uh, my lovely friend that <laughs> picked me up, this is what's happening. I said, I feel really bad. Oh, here I am at the rally pro mm. <laughs> promoting women's issues. And my husband is back home baking and making, keeping all the traditions. And he's been like the carrier of, mm. of the cultures. And with our, um, in our household, he was consistent in speaking to the children in Greek till now. He's the, the linguistic role model of Greek where I, I've spoken both. Now, it's a very different scenario with the, um, the grandchildren. Yeah, although my children are very fluent uh, in Greek, well, and my daughter married a non-Greek, so they speak English at home, the same with my son. I only speak to the granddaughters in, in Greek. How well they will learn Greek is a question mark, but as long as they have a positive association towards mm. the language and the culture, and mm. we're able to take them back to Greece, that's fine. Mm. So yeah. um, it, again, it's, yeah. it differs from family, yes. family and generation to generation. Mm. Thank you, Varvara. It does differ. That's true. Um, and um, I think what you, that point you made there is very pertinent. You know that the, as long as there is a positive association with the culture, whatever that, however defined, and how, whatever that looks like, I think that's a very enduring principle to to keep, you know, fighting for, or aspiring towards. So the final kind of wind up question really is this question about how we have reinvented ourselves in the diaspora and. Um, are we are we still doing that? I mean, is that a dynamic process um, around religion, around sexuality, around relationships? 
uh, around language. I mean, are we are we in this process of reinvention from generation to generation, or does does there still in, in, in you know the, the this sort of persistent idea of the good Greek girl? Does that is that still out there? I mean, I have no idea. Um, I was never a good Greek girl by any measure, so um, I failed that test quite quite you know significantly. Um, and I know because my parents did have an ideal. They were that generation and I never met, you know, I didn't meet so many of those markers. However, I, I'm intrigued to hear our panellists' view on this, whether that still is there or have we successfully, you know, constructed that out of existence, as it were, and, and we're now so dynamic and engaged with the world and there's so many sort of changes that that... that um, that fantasy, because I think it is a fantasy, um, you know, is not in our consciousness. So I'll start with Vicky actually on this one. What's your view, Vicky? Um, I think this one is very individual, and I think it does, you know, very much depend on your um, uh, your experience. Um, uh, I, for me, I think you know, I found my way of dealing with it um, and expressing it. And I think it is very much, um, as I said before, you, you, you know, you develop your own relation with Greece, with Greek culture. Um, so, uh, and I, you know, as I said, I went to Greece, I spent a lot of time there. So it has been very much a, a journey for me. Um, and I think, you know, you find your sweet spot in terms mm. of what you're comfortable with. Mm. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, there, there's um, uh, a lot of, people who, as I said, I think it also depends on your environment. So I think it's just about, it's very, you know, it's a very individual thing. Um, yeah, like you, I was never the, the good Greek girl. Uh, although I kind of was, but I kind of, you know, didn't you know, to some degree. So, but, you know, I challenged the one, the things that I wanted to, because it was it was about differentiating what, what was being, about being Greek and what was being, you know, a Greek in that point in time or a Greek girl growing up in Australia at that point in time. Mm. So very different when you mm. can redefine that for yourself in terms mm -hmm. of what you see is the important thing about you know how you express your Greekness so to speak yeah. Um, yeah. and I don't know if other you know Greeks this is a conversation that seems to be very much for for, for you know prevalent in Greek Australian circles mm. uh, I don't you don't have these discussions as much with your Italian friends or other friends mm. it's really interesting how um, it is it sort of looms large in our you know mm. our lives and our psyche so um, yeah, I think, it, it, you know, I'd like to think that the current generation, have, you know, find their own way and, mm. as I said, you know, get, get what they want out of the culture and mm. don't have those sort of really, you know, existential issues that we had back then yep. where you felt like you had to make a choice. Um, and there, there was one choice to make. It was very mono, wasn't it, really, the image of what it was to be a Greek woman, you know. Um, it was quite constrained. Very much so. Yeah. And um, and now, you know, being a career woman is acceptable. Yeah. There's a whole bunch yeah. of things that come with that. There's still very traditional to some degree expectations around that, um, but it's just changing. And I think, you know, um, it really is, is an individual choice these days. Yeah. All right, Vicky, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's great. Esther, over to you. You've given us some insight on to, on your own journey this way in, this, in these directions. Did you want to just say a little bit more about where that, where that construction sits at the moment in, in your view, yeah. It strikes me really that um, the Greek community in general and, and, and you know, us as Greek women of different generations are really in a really interesting position at the moment if we sort of zoom out to the Australian culture where we are experiencing uh, the most, you know, racist, sexist, misogynistic uh, climate um, that I've seen in my lifetime in Australia. And so the Greeks and Italians, John Howard famously said after he had his road to Damascus moment where he was, you know, against Asian immigration, then, you know, I think probably the treasurer whispered in his ear about how good it was for the economy. And then he sort of said at some point that it seemed that the Asians were now settling in like the Greeks and Italians who were, you know, basically mainstream. And so we're in this situation where there are, the Greek community is, is, is large, it's multi-generational, 
obviously, you know, the, the, the GOCMV has been around for, you know, well over 100 years or ha however long it's been. Um, and so we're in this position where we think about the rest of Australian society, that we are both, you know, uh, majoritarian and minoritarian. We have an obligation to call out racism, sexism and misogyny. When we look at the range of cultures who um, are, you know, uh, being um, uh, attacked at a particular time and then to we have a responsibility to then kind of flip that and not be focused on who uh, is being the focus um, of those attacks mm. but to look at um, you know a minority um, mm. you know cliched white male Australian culture that is you know absolutely scared to death of no longer being the majority, no longer having the right to, as we've been discussing throughout, mm. um, preserve culture, be the interpreters of culture, be, be the authority on culture. And so I think it puts us in yeah, a position of responsibility uh, for uh, ourselves, our relationships, our communities, our families and, and the broader Australian culture. Mm, okay, great. Thanks, Esther. Thank you for that. Yes, it's uh, we can reflect perhaps on discussion at discussion time about the impact of the last few weeks, but um, I think there's been a massive realignment of all sorts, actually, these last few weeks have been incredible. Um, thank you for taking us to that point. I'll over to Varvara and then um, I'll ask Anthea for the final words. So Varvara, over to you. This one about oh, okay. good Greek girl. <laughs> I was also the black sheep in the family. I married late. Um, I had children late. Um, and um, But I'm very hopeful of the new generation. And um, the interviews that I carried with the different women for the book, there's about 30 interviews, is a very mixed bag. We've got women that are very open about their sexuality, about going against their parents' uh, wishes, others that have had it really hard. Um, and uh, there's, it's a mixed bag. And again, it depends um, on their education, where are they mm -hmm. at, how strong their character is and where they want to go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I said, I'm really, really hopeful and the advice that I would give to uh, young women of the future and what I tell my daughters and granddaughters is um, be clear of where you want to go, uh, be eclectic, choose the best bits of the Greek culture and the best bits of our multicultural society and, and the Australian culture. And also be respectful of your partner's culture if you've married outside because we Greeks have this tendency of this superiority that our culture is the best and that does not create a very happy uh, environment mm. okay? okay so thanks. Um, yeah and thanks Ravada. no thank you no that's that's very important and selecting bits and pieces is a very important part of preserving but moving on I guess um, and so, Anthony, I'll leave it up to you to, to give us the final word on this about reinventing ourselves as Greek women and perhaps um, completely, um, mm. you know, debunking the good Greek girl model. Absolutely. Well, I agree with what everyone has said so far. I think um, you can never be uh, good enough for the Greek girl model, no matter how good you may be. So... Um, I think there's always something always will find, someone will always find at fault. So I fully think by my generation, I'd like to hope um, that we are brazen enough to uh, know that that standard is idealistic, like you mentioned, um, Vicky and Joy. And I think um, uh, by now there's, there's the acceptance as well that um, uh, strong Greek, we're very strong as Greek women. I think that's an inherent um, trait of us all, irrespective of the generation we've come from. Um, and I think that's, uh, that is what's helping us to transcend um, the issues we continue to face, um, be they what, even as they're evolving as issues. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're right. probably my final words. Thank you, Anthea. Thank you very much. And um, before we kick into the Q&A, which we'll do now, we've already got some questions. Just a quick, uh, enormous, enormous thank you to all our panellists for their um, eloquent and, and, and 
succinct and wonderfully engaging um, comments uh, throughout the discussion. Um, it's been a marvellous uh, interaction, I think, on so many levels. So thank you. Um, the, in the questions are hotting up. Uh, so let me take a few questions now. Um, uh, this question is about language from Petros Rosakias. Um, my question centres around language, which was raised and addressed so well by Anthea. Thank you. How important do you think access to the Greek language by future generation is in reference to identity and connection with family and the rich Greek culture? Can language and culture be decoupled? Interesting question. And then he says, there is only one good Greek girl in the Southern Hemisphere and she happens to be, by pure coincidence, my mum. That's lovely. Thank you, Petros. But the uncoupling, Petros' question around the uncoupling of culture and language, is that possible? Anthea, maybe you should take this one up because you were the one who talked yeah. about language. Yeah, definitely. Can you do um, that? I think you can, um, I think you can appreciate culture to a certain extent with, having, with not having, you know, a full... Um, fluency of language or a full, uh, uh, any, really any, um, any language uh, under your belt. But I do think it gets to a point where, yeah, potentially your, uh, your full knowledge of a culture is somewhat limited. Um, I, for one, studied French um, and uh, became fluent in French and preferred to continue that over my Greek studies, so stopped in year 10 for Greek. Mm -hmm. um, but can say that I'm still quite proficient in Greek. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I then developed a keen appreciation of French culture through learning French language. I, I just feel the two are, are, are intertwined. Okay. Anyone want to argue against that, like that you can uncouple language from culture? Esther, do you have a comment there? And, and argue. Uh, Petro, you mean I gloss in a it is just um, there are aspects of you know uh, being Greek, being Greek Australian. You know, I've I've written on this subject on the separate aspects of my identity: the Greek, the Australian, and the Greek Australian. They they are different. Um, there are aspects, as Anthea just you know described. I also speak French and German, uh, <laughs> a small amount of Italian. Um, but um, the process of learning Greek. Um, and learning any language connects you with the culture in, 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 a, in, yeah. in, in a very deep way. But also the process of learning language affects our brains in Correct. incredibly dynamic ways, like learning an art form. You know, mm. I remember being a child and uh, I changed primary schools at one point. My first primary school was 98% non-English speaking. And then the second one was like, I was in a minority of kids who spoke more than one language. And I remember just being a little kid and just being just extremely confused as to how all the other kids could even make thoughts in their heads. Mm. didn't have more mm. than one language. Mm. Um, and it goes to uh, Sava's question as well. Um, uh, again, that, that, that inferior complex and, 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 and language, that it's, um, you know, I, I do think it's absolutely necessary, as Sava says as well, but the, I'm going to temper that by saying that there is more than one Greek culture, there is more than one Greek yes. culture. And what we've done, what we just demonstrated here, but what we've done across uh, this country is have a number of really interesting, diverse Greek Australian subcultures, and that is mm. super interesting. Okay, thank you, Esther. I think we're going to just have to move through. And Esther mentioned Savas's question there. I think we've addressed some of that, Savas, around um, inferiority complex and language. So, if it's okay, I'll just go back to Vicky's question, Baladitsis. Vicky talks about: Do you think Greek culture and maintenance is due to the influence of the female? We've sort of opened up on that one. I think our sense was that yes, but it's complex. Um, I think we'll go over to George's question. Metsinis, would you comment on your experience of sexism and gender bias coming from Greek Australians of your generation? How is that different to the wider community? Interesting question, George. Um, Vicky, I'll go to you for that one, kick off. Questions of sexism, gender, is it different to women, you know, in, in our wider society, as we've noted, of course, this last few weeks? In terms of right now, at this point in time, I think certainly growing up, it was, you know, do I go in the, you know, you know, after us. Why can my brother do this? You know, I can't do this in our body. That was very um, strong. Um, look, I think it still persists. Um, 
I think there is um, an element of that boisiness, you know, very much the Greek boisiness um, and their you know, views of women. I mean, again, it depends on the people, depends on, it's very, you know, um, but I think that persists a little bit in the culture and, um, and there is a sort of still ultimately the, the, the wife role model, you know, is very strong as opposed to the sort of the equal woman. So I, look, it really depends on, on where you sit in the, whether it's in the workforce or whether it's in the family life. Um, mm-hmm. But there's definitely a lot of gender bias, possibly a little bit more than the normal community, but probably not. I don't know. I think that's, it's pretty widespread. Mm. It's an interesting question, I think, especially the events of the last few weeks, you know, uh, we've responded as women, but also I think there are some cultural specificities around the, 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 the manifestation or expression of um, uh, sexism, actually, culturally within a community, be it Greek or, or other communities. Anyone else? Want to unconscious to bias as well, I think. Sorry. Yes. Uh, if, no, I sure, go. I think a lot of the time it's just something that comes out without sort of much thought. Okay, sure, Vicky. Anyone want to kick in there on this question, Barbara? Come on in. We can't really generalise again. We don't know. Mm -hmm. There's no research to compare the two, George. But given the makeup of our organisations, majority uh, Mm -hmm. male dominated, uh, one would question the makeup of that and um, the the conscious and unconscious biases that exist. And why aren't women um, entering those organisations? Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly uh, feel that, you know, uh, we have a long way to go uh, in terms of um, as a community. Mm-hmm. Whether they're conscious or unconscious, I'm not sure. But mm-hmm. we've got a long way to go. And this is probably <laughs> a subject for another forum. Mm. Thanks, Bavada. <laughs> Okay, I'll just move to our next question, which is from um, Alex Delios. Um, Those of you who know Alex's work, she's a very fine historian and uh, a wonderful contributor to understandings of Greek history and culture. It's great to see Alex putting through his question. The question is about regionalism. Um, um, Could any of the panellists speak around regionalism, whether those that regionalism in Greece and regional cultural practices, including language, and sense of identity was or wasn't muted in the diaspora. Now, I guess the regional part of, you know, Greece is obviously a very complex country. It's, it, it's regionalism is um, quite significant, I think, um, north, south, etc. Does anyone want to comment on that? I mean, did we see, have we seen regional uh, cultural practices muted in Australia, promoted in Australia? How do we, how do we understand this? I think Pontians is a, is a great example. Uh, the Cypriots, um, the uh, yeah. they're very two very good examples, mm-hmm. and they are progressing. Um, I would say uh, much more quickly, mm-hmm. or in a more um, what's mm-hmm. the word progressive way than some of the other groups, and mm-hmm. they identify with that language and all those traditions. There's definitely, um, and all of the initial groups that were set up here in mm-hmm. Australia, Alexander, you would know more than me uh, as a historian, they're all topical ethnic guys, they call them. Mm-hmm. And of course, um, mm-hmm. those, the language, the dialect that they, uh, mm-hmm. they have, the traditions are part of, of those groups. Mm. Thank you, Barbara. I think uh, Andrew. Yeah. I would just add, yeah, exactly. Mm. I think mm. um, you know, well, I'm from the north, but um I I definitely my dad's Horyo has its own community center within um within Melbourne, but then there's also this element again, back to food, where you you begin to appreciate Greece's vast um uh how vast it is as a country, although small in footprint, but just how regional um uh, certain areas are through food you know mm. you learn oh what's good from the north oh they're the best at fifth s we are the best at fifth s as opposed to other areas of greece where different um different mm. foods come from so that's at least how i've learned about regionalism mm. uh but uh i don't know can't answer if it's been muted um within the broader australian community thank you i think um vicky yeah, just um, one of the things I've noticed is obviously with things like the Cretans, I think are a really good example of where um, they maintain an incredibly strong uh, regional identity through the dance groups, through 
uh, Correct. a very strong mm. regional culture and that's mm. got a lot of young people who, are, who identify very much in Australia as Cretan. Mm. Um, and these are third generation kids who mm. dance, who do it. And I think they've done that through music, through dance and a very specific thing, whereas I think, you know, people who come from more obscure or smaller villages where there hasn't been a strong identity, you know, mm. regional identity might be more identify as a Greek as opposed to from, you know, your little village. But, yeah, the Cretans and um, certain regions where there's that strong um, mm. thing are very different. Thanks, Vicky. Absolutely. So I've got a two. I've got one or two, uh, about two or three final questions, um, and then we'll have to sort of wind up. Um, one is about the first one is about assimilation, and I think Varvara, you talked a bit about this. Um, I mean, the question is really about Greek women and assimilating. Um, I mean, I guess the question can be taken more broadly. Really, you know, have, have has the Greek community assimilated too much? Not really, uh, because if you look at all the studies in terms of our retention of language, um, uh, Greeks are on the top um, and the other end is the Dutch. So we've got the highest um, level of, of um, well, I'm losing my words, uh, of, of um, carrying out our um, of, uh, language. And I think there was one question there whether language is important. Yes, um, some, who is it? Savas. For all of us, language is very, very important. Language and culture are inseparable and you think through and learn through one another. So uh, I don't think um, we have assimilated as much as some of the other groups. And I'm very hopeful that we won't. Um, and mm. it's cool to be Greek today. Mm. It wasn't cool to be Greek uh, no. 20 years ago, 30 years no. ago. So mm. people take um, pride in their um, identity and their culture. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Vavada. I'll just, unless anyone wants to quickly move in there, I'll just go through the last few questions because we, I see it's already 20 past eight. Um, so Connie makes a nice comment here, a really interesting comment about how for the baby boomers, parents are ageing and passing away, of course, and entering a new phase of disconnecting with culture and family. And um, I think that's a really interesting comment about what happens when your parents pass um, and the challenges there of connecting um, and, and maintaining the culture. Um, anyone want to comment on that? Maybe, maybe Vicky, because you've talked a bit about that and your mother passed away and your elderly father. I mean, do you feel that sense that you'll have to reconnect a whole new way into the future? Absolutely. I think that's something I, I've thought about. And he's mm -hmm. the only, my parents were both the only uh, ones in their families who migrated here. So mm. I did, never met my grandparents either. Mm. So I've always felt that disconnect anyway. Um, mm. And my relationships, my friends, my family in Greece are stronger than my father's because he's only been there once. So again, mm. I've been carrying that relationship with Greece as well because he hasn't, mm. um, which is quite unusual, I think. Mm. Um, mm. And so I do feel that. I don't know what's going to happen because, again, with my son, the only access he has to that world is my father. Mm. Uh, and then that's mm. why the, sort of the Greek school um, community and other communities are important. But it's different to having that in your family. So, yeah, I mm. think that's the big phase for people who, who start losing their parents and, and um, uh, yeah, what do you have left at that point? Yeah. You know? Indeed, indeed. It's quite a profound moment, isn't it? Um, uh, this question, uh, and I promise we'll finish, I think our, uh, we've been working our panellists very hard here. Uh, Constantina? Dina, um, this one is for Esther, um, actually. It's um, talking about the complexity of the diaspora experience manifest itself in the arts. Do you want to say something about the visual arts, Esther? I mean, I suppose this one comes to your expertise particularly. It's a massive question, but, um, you know, how has that complexity of diaspora been manifest? I mean, it's been a very obviously vibrant, rich um, cultural expression in the arts here in Australia, um, the whole, you know, articulation of the diaspora and what that means. And so many extraordinary uh, visual artists and experimental artists who I could reference my work across, uh, in, the, in the past has been across all art forms. And when one, um, I, I think of um, 
uh, something that um, Christos Chalkas experiences uh, in a really interesting way that um, with his work having been translated uh, into Greek and into many other languages, um, he has been told by Greek critics that his style of writing is more Greek than Greek Australian, um, mm. even though he doesn't have that experience of, of, of having grown up there. And then we've got, you know, a range of, um, um, of artists and others who um, are kind of, you know, I think one of us mentioned earlier in that period of multicultural policy in the 80s and possibly into the early 90s, there were a whole range of programs around cultural diversity being more mainstream and you had that kind of cultural diversity championed. We've mm. now gone into a bit of reverse mm. where the cultural diversity of artists and arts workers is actually less than it was at that time. Um, and it's, yeah, it is, it is truly, truly shocking. Um, and so um, I think it's, um, um, it's something that we learn from um, uh, our first people's artists in that sense of, you know, who are you? Where did you come from? Where are your parents from? What's your story? Um, mm -hmm. And as, um, as is expressed in the uh, Boomerang and, and uh, Woiwurrung language, that, that the notion of omenjika, which means welcome, but it also means come with purpose. So when we say in Greek, it means, you know, it's come, come with, come with the Buddha. You know, it's good to, it's good to see you, you are welcome. That same word for welcome. Mm. Um, but that notion of come with purpose is something that I think is really interesting for orienting us, not just mm. to the art that we're experiencing, but our relationships with each other. Thank you, Esther. And uh, you'll see there in the comments section, there's been a bit of to and froing around um, connecting up, continuing this discussion looking at where there are there are groups in existence. Um, of course, uh, Varvara's group, uh, the Network Food for Thought, and um, Anthony's also mentioned there, um, you know, the, the book club there from um, Ahipa. Um, so we can, you know, we can keep talking on the, on this front um, and, and the connectedness that, that is already out there. Um, I think, though, at 8.25, we should give our panellists a rest, but not before I'd like to ask them if they wouldn't mind, just as we wind up, to um, just one sentence about the future and advice they would give to the women of the future, because one of our first questions was, how do you see... Um, uh, Australians with Greek background in 2071, in 50 years. I guess I'd rework that slightly, Alexandra, and say, how would you see the women of, you know, in Australia with a Greek background in the future? What, what advice or what thoughts would you share? And um, I'll start again with Anthea. Just a sentence. Oh, gosh. Um, uh I would say uh, be proud, be bold, and um, and just nurture yourself, but also retain that Greekness of, uh, you know, the philothimo, of nurturing others, um, because no matter for who, uh, it, it is a beautiful essence of our culture. Thank you, Anthony. Beautifully put. Much appreciated. Uh, Varvara. Check out all the things that uh, hold you back from the culture. And be eclectic, uh, focus on the philotimo, the hospitality, the education, and be proud of who you are. Uh, and also uh, be compassionate and have empathy for your parents. And they will support you to the nth degree. I've lost mine too young uh, and I, I wish they were still around. So um, that's my advice. And the future is that women, women Women and wogs, as Megaloyeni said it in his book, Generation W, the future belongs to women. Women and wogs and uh, Greek women or cold women, all women, women of colour. Thank you. Thank you, Varvara. Esther. Oh, here, here. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely essential that... Um, and drawing on, you know, the, uh, the, the 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 classical, the Greek philosophy, the big questions that um, you know that that, that that the Greeks invented, as we know, um, we need to keep maintaining that curious and critical stance 
um, just when we think we know who we are, to ask ourselves and to stop um, and to just, you know, be creative, be connected, um, but to, yeah, maintain that curiousness and that criticality because that's how we create the future together. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so much for that. And over to you, Vicky. Uh, final note. Um, mm. I think the same theme, you know, explore and sort of discover, you know, your griefness. You know, you've got to be comfortable in your skin and, and you know, go back to the source. For me, it's always about um, going back to, um, to the place, you know. I'll see you in Fitzroy, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you again to all our panellists for such an inspiring session. It's been really rich engaging, illuminating, and, and so um, uplifting. So on behalf of all our participants, um, thank you very much to each and every one of you for your generous comments and sharing those with us. Um, Nick gave me a little bit of a free hand when he said, uh, if the discussion's going really well, keep it going, Joy. So Nick, at 8.29, we could keep going, but I think, um, I think uh, to be fair to everyone, we should now end. And again, pause to thank our, our panelists. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Nick, for the final wrap. Costa? Okay. Costa? Am I on? Yes, you are, Nick. Okay. <laughs> um, well, what a fabulous discussion. Um, I'm sure we could have easily gone till um, midnight. There was a lot of um, <laughs> momentum. And many of the issues raised, I'm sure all the participants touched the sort of um, the emotional cord with all our participants and followers as well. Um, just want to make one comment regarding the uh, the language question. It's it's super critical. And I don't just say that because I'm in education. Nothing stops you identifying or engaging with your Greek identity because you don't have the language, but you can only take it so far. Language allows you to take it to the next level and there's other uh, benefits as well. Um, the only other thing I want to say, Joy, um, if you're still interested in improving that Good Greek girl image. We do have a solution on the language front. The Greek community, Monday to Friday evenings, does have modern Greek for adult classes. So it's, it's never too late. It's never uh, too late, Nick. I'm, I, I will take you up on that one day <laughs> and you will be shocked, but I will do it. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for participating again. Uh, and just a reminder regarding next week's seminar by Dr. Alexander uh, Kidrov. Okay. Thank you again and hope to see you um, next week and weeks to come. Thanks, Bye, Nick. everyone. Thanks, everyone. For this Thank you all. Thank Have you. Good evening. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thank it was great. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, look, I, Nick, unmute, unmute. Yep, sorry, just. Sakuo, Sakuo.